Uh, I have, a, before I start off, I have a little question. Who is, who has had experience with spatial software in the past? Could you raise your hand, please? One. Okay. Thank you. That's, uh, that gives me a little sort of uh, idea how to approach this. Uh, my name is Mark, and I work for Eclipse Foundation as their uh, ecosystem developer, which means that I am in charge of getting projects, uh, businesses, end users from NGOs and governmental agencies, and even also the businesses themselves, to sort of participate in joint development of location aware. Oh, now I'm, I'm here, and I'm there. Okay, now I hear myself, sorry. Um, and for uh, Location Tech. And Location Tech is the working group that uh, occupies itself with big geospatial data. Now, big geospatial data, well, we have so many sensors already uh, in our lives. We have satellites in orbit, low, high, and medium orbit. We have uh, social networks, and they all read various amounts and types of data. Um, and it grows. It grows at a tremendous pace. But if you realize that 80% of all data available has a, rela a relationship to a certain location, uh, it is location uh, aware almost, especially if it's a sensor, then you can sort of imagine that it knows where it is and what it is observing. Um, with an 80-20 rule, you could say, okay, 80% of all data has a geospatial component. And that enables you to make all that information more or less actionable, whether it's a person-to-person -person or machine-to-machine -machine, uh, type of relationship that needs to be uh, sussed out, you can actually, with the use of geospatial data, make it almost uh, comprehensible to the layman. A picture says more than a thousand words, so you have then the opportunity to have, let's say, discussions, conversations about what to do how to sort of uh, make a strategy on top of that data that your manager, a non-tech person, understands. Um, there are several Vs, they're called, they're called applicable to big data. Um, sometimes there are four, sometimes there are seven. I took the seven because that gave me the most uh, room to talk about the geospatial component of it. First, volume. Well, if all that volume times 80% uh, is calculated, then you still are faced with huge amounts of data specific, uh, sorry, geospatial data specific information. Uh, and that needs to be uh, processed, rendered, put into a map, for instance, at a, at a velocity that normal spatial software is not capable uh, of dealing with. You, were, uh, you had dealt with geospatial software. What type of software was that? Could you tell me? Yeah, okay. That is not open source to start off with. Uh, there are great alternatives in the open spatial uh, arena. But that is actually geared towards what we call uh, very high latency, uh, low volume types of data processing. You agree with me? Thank you. Um, now, that data comes in all shapes, sizes, and you have to sort of make it sort of into a mass that you could say, okay, we can compare this bit of the data with that bit of data. Now, the only way to do that, I think, is by finding a common denominator for that whole bunch of, what is it, uh, what, whatever types of uh, information you want together. And that 
common denominator is its precise location somewhere on this earth, whether it's in a building or outside. But that is what ties everything together. And now, uh, can you imagine that not everything is fixed into one place? Quite a lot of sensors, if you call them, move. Uh, whether it's your car, that has a certain speed. So everything that it is, if it's enabled for that, everything that it measures has also a temporal aspect. Now, traditional, like the software that you have used, takes only into account one place, one piece of da data, and anything else is sort of uh, ignored. The moment that you say, hey, that piece of, what is it, uh, furniture, that car is moving, then the traditional software is not able to uh, accommodate and process that type of information. Now, is it true? what you measure. Well, anything can be lied about, but the one thing that is totally inert is its latitude and its longitude. Again, that is the common denominator. I talked about it earlier. To put it all into a map, all that information, where you have layer upon layer upon layer, and you can sort of have a pin going through it for one single location, one latitude longitude uh, measure, then you suddenly can have an interaction with that map. And you can say, hey, if I correlate this piece of information with that piece of information, this layer with that layer, for that specific place, then you suddenly have relational insights, insights that you will not gather so easily from a pie chart a bar chart or whatever type of visualization that you have chosen before. Now, there are two sides to location. I call them the simple context and the dynamic context. Simple is just what I earlier said, that single position of this table in this spot. And I can monitor its behavior. I can manage it. I can and I can manage the data that this table would eventually maybe produce, and I could edit it. Now, with all those sensors and all those uh, satellites orbiting Earth, it is not about the static element of a location and the information that correlates with that. There's a dynamic element to it. I, we can sort of have a relationship and we can uh, communicate and in the meantime I can move. So everything that I measure in respect to that location changes. So there is a peer-to-peer -peer variable uh, data communication going on. And I could also say, and I'll get back to that later on, in a specific zone, my presence is measured. If I step outside of that zone, then I don't exist anymore. Within that zone, I can have an interaction with that table. If I step out of it, this table will not measure me. Maybe I cannot even see the bloody table. But it allows sensors to be triggered. It allows me and the sensor to be alerted to something. Hey, you're walking in the street and holy, there's a sale in the nearby shop and it pops up on my phone. And I get a message that says, Sorry, that was the message that I got and sa that said, especially for you, with your customer profile, we have the biggest sale opportunity in that shop further down the street. Just walk 10 steps and you're there. 
in other words, I sometimes say, okay, imagine yourself walking into a room, the door closes and the room is pitch black. The only thing that you want to know is what's in that room? Is it a thing? Is it a person? Is that person uh, a mass murderer or is that a colleague or is that a table or is that a something very dangerous? But it's dark. But you want to know at least where that thing or that person is. And secondly, you want to know how close you are to that thing or person. And that is where the dynamic element comes into play. With your eyes closed, you have to sort of suss out where something is and what it is. A great example of that is geofencing. We call it geofencing. You have a, param a parameter around a certain location, and within that location you are alerted to sales opportunities. You are maybe alerted, uh, if you step out of that per perimeter, that, uh, oh, if your child steps out of that perimeter, hey, my child is gone. You are, uh, are alerted to something that you could so say is, uh, for security reasons, made up for your and the child's safety. You go, and that is just sort of in your direct environment. You could have a whole city. I enter the city and suddenly uh, I have the opportunity to park my car and I don't need to put money into a meter or a credit card into a meter. No, it just recognizes me parking that car within that zone. And for specific zones, I live in Amsterdam, if you park in the middle of the uh, old town, you pay about six euro per hour. If you do it more in the outskirts, you pay three euros an hour. And if you have that type of zoning and interaction going on, that would really save me the trouble of having spare cash or a credit card available at that point. Um, for companies, it's also nice to track their assets. If you have a fleet of cars or of uh, uh, harvesting machines, then you want to know at every moment where it is and maybe also why it is there. Um, when it comes to buildings, you could have an uh, opportunity to, so, to say, okay, within a certain time limit, I want to measure the performance of the elevations. Do they need to be cleaned? Do they uh, need to be uh, repaired? All sorts of applications are available within that certain zone, area or parameter. Now, Location Tech, we call it the home of big geospatial data. And as an industry working group for Eclipse, we work on the, uh, in a collaborative environment on specific projects. I'll get back to the projects later on. Um, and we focus specifically at what we call big geospatial data with a temporal spatial element to it. Everything that traditional uh, geospatial software is not able to manage, to process and to visualize. We have a steering committee, and it consists of the usual suspects. We have a number of participating members, and that's a growing uh, group. Um, most of them are presently in uh, America, but we are now building out, out the ecosystem in Europe. Uh, it's for us a little bit uncharted waters. Maybe that's why I came in, because I'm European, and it's close by for me. Projects, uh, I do four projects for you. Very simple, very easy. And GeoMesa is a collection of libraries that is able to manage huge amounts of data, geospatial vector data. And it's able to have it streamed real time into your uh, viewer. It is a distributed architecture that it uses and well, we support various new cloud storage systems. 
another one is especially uh, it, it looks a little bit like Geomesa, the one before, but it has the what I would call interactive query uh, opportunities for temporal spatial information. And it is specifically uh, geared towards visualization in other open spatial software uh, tools like GeoServer. The third one is GeoTrellis. And there it is all about speed, 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 and more speed. It, it allows for a distributed computation and rapid processing of geospatial data wherever it comes from. GeoGig is, well, it is a little ripoff of what GitHub normally does. Uh, it is specifically uh, engineered, developed, and designed to incorporate geospatial data. And thereby you can track changes over time. You can roll back the picture, you can move forward the picture, and thereby you can have a storyline. You can actually show trends over time. Those four are only a handful out of the rest of our projects. However, we are building now a comprehensive suite where hopefully in a couple of years we are able to accommodate all spatial needs, requirements that will be put upon us due to sensor developments, satellites uh, that will go off uh, into the skies, more social network uh, applications. If you want to have some more information on it, us, then you can find us uh, walking around here in the, uh, on the venue. We are having a big conference in St. Louis upcoming May, and for whoever, whoever uh, has the time and the, the budget to go, please take your time and go to uh, the 14th of May to St. Louis, where we will showcase all the developments within the working group, with the projects, and hopefully uh, have by that time some more projects in. You can find more information on our website, Twitter, the usual uh, channels. Uh, Thea Aldrich is sitting there. I'm Mark, and Paul is walking around somewhere uh, in the hallway. If you have questions, please, I'm sort of looking at you, uh, please, state your question and I hopefully, because we have some minutes uh, left over, I can answer those questions. Nope. Okay, then thank you for your uh, attendance and uh, hopefully we'll uh, meet later on. Thank you.